Well, from Washington, I'm joined by Webster Griffin Tarpley, author and historian. Welcome to the program, sir. Mr. Tarpley, uh, looking at the Thank rights you. record of the participants of the meeting in Geneva, particularly that of the United States, it's uh, somehow hard to believe that their only concern is human rights. I mean, can you tell us how a regime change in Syria may benefit every participant in that conference? Well, the, the current uh, U.S. policy under the Obama administration with Hillary Clinton at the State Department aims at the destruction of all sovereign states on this planet. It's really rolling the world situation back to the time before the Treaty of Westphalia in, uh, in 1648, which established the regime of modern independent sovereign states. The desperation of the U.S. and the British comes from their financial bankruptcy. And what they've got to do is increase the rate of exploitation and looting and sacking uh, of the entire world economy. And in the course of this, they find that any national government is an intolerable obstacle. It gets in their way. Uh, it can say no, right? Mubarak said no to them on numerous occasions. Gaddafi said no most of the time. So they've decided to smash up these countries. But notice, their goal is not just regime change. It's now microstates, mini-states, to use the terms of Zbigniew Brzezinski, partition, the favorite term of George Soros, balkanization, failed states, rump states, um, warlords, uh, warlords of the type that, that we see, for example, in, uh, in Libya. So this is the goal, uh, to have a situation where the International Monetary Fund and NATO rule the world from above, but then on the ground you've got a kind of crazy quilt of petty, squabbling, impotent little entities that could never resist ExxonMobil or JP Morgan Chase or Halliburton uh, or anything of the kind. Something again like Libya uh, today. So that's, that's where they're headed with this. It would be then to break up Syria, to detach the Kurdish part, to detach parts that would be claimed by Turkey, uh, to perhaps start the Lebanese civil war again. Uh, perhaps there would be a continuous civil war in Syria. Perhaps Israel would start helping itself to, to various tracts of territory and so on down the line. So that's where it's going. It's very sinister. And anyway, well, taking a look at the situation on the ground, I mean, for how long do you think uh, uh, Assad and the Assad administration in general will be able to absorb such huge pressure and stay in power? I think indefinitely. I think for a very long time. And uh, Assad's holding power may turn out to be greater than the holding power of the coalition that is arrayed against them. Now, this, of course, depends on Russia and China maintaining their current blocking position in the, in the Security Council. Uh, Hillary Clinton, after that tirade, that outburst that we just heard, her hysterical plan is to go back to the UN Security Council and to try once again to get a Chapter 7 uh, resolution through the Security Council. And that will include draconian economic sanctions and it will eventually lead then to an armed attack, uh, a no-fly zone, meaning bombing, humanitarian corridors, buffer zones, and so forth. That will be a, a massive attack on, on Syria. There's no indication that Russia will go along. Lavrov, uh, leaving the proceedings today, said the important thing is that nothing has been imposed. And when we look at this empty formula that they've come up with, it's a kind of a face-saving piece of rhetoric or boilerplate for all of them. On the one side, Assad and his government have said, we will not accept a, uh, a solution dictated by foreigners. That's sound policy. And then we have the Syrian National Council, uh, always uh, helpful in this way. They say they will never negotiate with Assad because Assad has blood on his hands. We're finding out right now, thanks to the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung of Germany, big conservative paper in Frankfurt, that it was the Syrian uh, the Free Syrian Army that carried out the Hula massacre. Not, not Assad, not the Syrian army, but rather these bloody NATO death squads that have been brought in, which Hillary Clinton is supporting, and, and Haig, and Fabius, uh, and the rest of these people. And indeed, Kofi Annan, the hypocrite, is nothing but a front man for essentially these, these death squads. 
Indeed. Uh, I mean, there is talk of a coalition government, and you pointed to it uh, uh, briefly. Uh, but, uh, I mean, how likely will this coalition government be formed, and just how much uh, will Assad agree to it? Well, uh, th there have been elections. Uh, that's another one of these sort of Orwellian features of these proceedings, right? There have just been elections in Syria in which more than 50%, I'm not sure exactly how many, but by all indications, more than half of uh, the people who were registered to vote have voted, and there were opposition figures. Not everybody elected in those elections was from the, from the Ba'ath Party. Of course, the uh, Syrian National Council, a group of adventurers who like to live in expensive hotels and make pronunciations to the, to the four points of the compass, they, they always say they won't negotiate. Why would they? They're living high on the hog the way it is. But um, there have been elections where you didn't have to be a member of the Ba'ath Party, so free elections have been held. But Kofi Annan said, those are not good enough. That's not what we mean. Well, what do you mean then, given the fact that the Syrian uh, Free Army, the Syrian National Council, they say they won't participate in elections. So uh, they are the ones who are intractable, and the guilt for the crisis goes to them. I think Assad can hold out for quite a while. Indeed. Fair enough. We'll leave it there for the time being. Many thanks to Dr. Webster Griffin Tarpley, author and historian from Thank Washington. You.